Let's open our Bibles together to Revelation 19. Revelation 19, we'll be reading verses 6 through 9 today as we continue our study on the topic of heaven. Let's please rise as we hear God's holy word today. This is John's vision that God gave to him about heaven, his first eyewitness of what's going on. Let's now hear what he had to say. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like a roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege and an honor it is to come into your presence, to hear your words to us, to be granted this glimpse of our heaven to be. Lord, one day we will hear that multitude and our voices will sing out in it. Glory to you, God. I just pray that you open up our hearts and our minds this morning, that we approach the scripture not uh, academically, not uh, very detached, but Lord, as one who's preparing to enter into your presence one day. In your name, amen. Please have a seat. I may have mentioned this before, but if there's anything that we as people are really good at, it's coming up with occasions to celebrate pretty much every day of the calendar year. So if you're feeling a little blah this October, I don't know, the, the weather's been a little blah lately. We need an occasion to celebrate. You're not short on ideas. There's plenty of things going on this month. Any given day, there's, did you realize there's like 10 to 20 official holidays any given day on the calendar year. It's crazy. Some of the ones this October, I'm not making any of these up. National Chicken Fried Steak Day. Take Your Teddy Bear to Work Day. That sounds professional. Mother-in-Law Day. Did you know that there was one? You celebrate it? Send her a present? Okay. National Hair Day. Some of you are exempt from celebrating. It's okay. <laughs> World Octopus Day, and the best holiday of all, October 14th, so this was yesterday, National Dessert Day. Yes. Did you guys, anybody celebrate National Dessert Day? So, all right. I think some of these holidays are a legitimately good excuse to celebrate. Some, I think, are stretching it a little far. But whatever occasions, whatever reasons we have for celebrating something here on earth just absolutely pales in comparison to our occasion to celebrate in heaven. Psalm 1611 gives us an amazing promise. It says, when we arrive in the presence of God, we will be subject to the fullness of joy and experience all eternal pleasures at the Lord's right hand. Not just some joy, not just a little bit of pleasures, but the fullness, eternal, ongoing pleasures. That is a cause for celebration. Let's get it out of our minds that heaven is some sort of quiet chapel service with uncomfortable pews. It's not. It is a place of continual celebration. Parties, voices, songs, just people bursting out to say glory be to the Father. We'll find no end of reasons there to be merry and have great cheer. So why will we be celebrating? Well, there's many reasons for that. But I, I want to look at three reasons today, three reasons why the Bible gives us that we will be celebrating in heaven, why celebration is an essential part of the heavenly experience. Well, first of all, we're going to be celebrating what isn't there. I'll never forget when I went to a friend's wedding in Vancouver in 2004. It was, an, it was a fine service. It was a, it's a Catholic service, so you know it's like 
10 hours long. But a after that, there was a reception. And that's when things started to go off the rails because they had an open bar. And a few people took that, you know, they imbibed a little too much. And so in the middle of like, they're, they're doing the toasts, right? And so they're giving each other toasts. And in the middle of the toast, Uncle Mark, who's had way too much, stands up and he says, let's sing a song. And he starts trying to direct a, like a choir director, an insane choir director, and everybody's looking around like, Mark, this is not your time. Sit down. This, and then they, there were some fights that happened between family members. And it didn't make the whole reception a flop. But when people were acting out like that, you only had to look at the bride and the groom's face to know exactly what they were thinking. This would be a perfect night if those people weren't here. And I know that's, that's not a nice Christian thing to think, but sometimes we think that. It's, this would be perfect if that person wasn't here or this wasn't the case or one thing was different because it doesn't take much to ruin a good time for us. Just a little bit of rain on a picnic ruins that. Cooking with baking powder when the recipe says baking soda will ruin, right? I've done that before. You know, one little thing, right? Getting a work call in the middle of your vacation on a beach. One thing can ruin a really good experience. And so sometimes when we think about heaven and all we have to relate to is our life here, we might worry, well, heaven sounds good, but you know what? It sounds a little too good. Sooner or later, something's going to ruin that. An Uncle Mark or a work call or a little bit of rain, whatever it is, is going to ruin that perfect experience. And so we become worry warts. And the Bible needs to, to calm us down. And I think it's very interesting that when the Bible is often trying to convey what heaven is, it often is saying what's not going to be there. So it's trying to describe what heaven is by what it's lacking, what it doesn't have at all. Scripture says if you're always the type of person to wait for the other shoe to drop, you're going to be waiting an awfully long time in God's presence. So what does heaven lack? Well, if you go ahead to almost the end of the Bible in Revelation 21, that very famous chapter on the description of heaven, it says we get a whole list of very notable bummers that won't be there at all. For starters, there's no sin at all in heaven. Therefore, there's no curse and there's no death. There's no pain. And so if we don't have sin and we don't have pain and we don't have death, it goes on and says we also don't have sorrow. We don't have grief. We don't have tears. Another thing that uh, we don't talk about that often, but I found was really interesting in this chapter, is that heaven says there's no conflict. There's no fear of war in heaven. Right now we're watching the news, and I think that's all we're talking about with everything going on in Israel right now, or everything in the Ukraine, is war. We see war all over the world, and we worry this is going to spiral out of control. Will war ever touch us? Well, in heaven, it says the gates of heaven are always open. That's because God is not scared of an invasion. He's not worried one day an external force will come in and cause a threat to the peace of heaven. He's not worried about that at all. The gates are always open. Where are some other things we find that are lacking in heaven? Well, if we flip elsewhere in the Bible, we find some other omissions. 1 Peter 1.4 says that when we come into our inheritance, it will be an inheritance that never perishes, spoils, or fades. Three things that don't happen in heaven. When God gives you something good, it never perishes, it never spoils, it never fades away. I don't own a single thing on this world that doesn't eventually perish, spoil, or fade away. But that's what God's saying. He's going to give you something awesome. And if you're ever anxious that there's a sell-by date, that there's an expiration on these good gifts he's going to give you, you don't have to worry about that. Bright and shiny on day one, bright and shiny on day one million. Isaiah 65 tells us that another thing that's lacking in heaven is that we won't be attached to this life any longer. We will have memories of this, but we won't have a fondness for it. Nostalgia won't be something that we'll be experiencing in heaven. We won't be going, man, I wish I could go back. I miss those days. No, it says we won't be attached to our former life. And because we're not attached anymore, 
We won't weep. We won't experience pain that this life brings out in us. We might uh, intellectually, our minds might remember a loss we had, but we won't be attached to that loss any longer. We won't be attached to the pain that we went through for the sake of the cross. We won't remember with a cringing memory of those awkward days that we had where we made a mistake or we let somebody down. That's just not a thing that exists in heaven. Another thing that is lacking in heaven is a church building, a central temple. It says there is no central temple in heaven. We don't have to go to a place to worship God because God is everywhere in heaven. We can worship him anywhere we are. And that is something that is pretty interesting. So by looking at what God's keeping out of heaven, all that pain and death and awkwardness and grief and having to go someplace on a Sunday morning, we have a great cause to celebrate. You can't experience the fullness of joy that Psalm 16 says if there's even the slightest thing to hold you back. So God is bending over backwards to tell you there will be nothing to hold you back from the fullness of joy. There will be nothing in heaven that will cause you to go, wow, this would be a good day if it wasn't for this one thing. It won't exist. Another cause for great celebration is that Jesus Christ will be remaking heaven and earth with his glory. And again, we might hear that, and some anxiety might come out of that because we're a little bit attached to this world. We talked about that last week. We have a lot of baggage here. We have our stuff is here. We have memories here. We have people here. And when we walk around, we can relate with this world. We understand it to some degree. And then we read in the Bible that Jesus is going to remake it. He's going to, he's going to take away this world and refashion it. Well, if God's remaking it, will this world suddenly feel weird and alien to us? Well, I had that sort of attitude my freshman year of high school. My freshman year, we were in a, a small, it was a, a Christian school, so it was just a small building that our high school was in. And we had maybe eight rooms and lockers and one hallway and a couple bathrooms, and that was the whole building. That was my freshman year. My graduating class was 54, so it was very, very small. But we had this whole old building, and it was fine. It was what we knew and what we were used to our freshman year. But we knew that they were building a new building. And we knew that at the end of our freshman year, we'd have to transition over to this new building. And a few of us were actually resenting the thought of doing that. We didn't want to move on. We, liked, we perfectly liked where our lockers were, and we knew how our rooms were and all that. And so this thought of a new place gave us a little bit of anxiety. But of course, what happened was we moved to the new building in our sophomore year, and we ended up loving it. It was amazing. It was huge. It had two hallways, not just one, two. It had many rooms. It had carpeted floors. It had whiteboards instead of chalkboard, all these new amenities. It was great. And after a year there, we couldn't even imagine. If they told us to go back, we'd probably stage a walkout. We'd protest. There's no way you'd get us to go back to the old place when we've come to love this new one so much. Well, our inheritance in heaven may not have an expiration date, but this world does. This world will end. When Adam and Eve brought sin into existence, have you ever thought about how sin not just affected people, but affected all of creation? Genesis 3.17 says when God was delivering curses because of the, the fall of man, he cursed the very earth itself. He cursed the ground. And Romans 8 said ever since then, Paul writes, the whole creation has been groaning as if it's in the pains of childbirth until the present time. Have you ever heard somebody in childbirth? It's not pleasant noises. They are in pain. They are in agony. They want it to be over with. And he says all of creation has been groaning ever since the fall until this day in 2023. It has been groaning waiting to be reborn, wanting this to be over. I find it very interesting, so many places in the Bible, that God talks about how nature has feelings, is able to have actions, and I don't think we want to like really dig into that too much and say, well, nature is a being, but there is a presence to nature. It is God's creation, and it is able to do things. 
Remember how Jesus said, if you, if you don't, um, when, when he was processing into Jerusalem, he says, well, if they didn't cry out my name, even the stones would cry out. There's something about nature that responds to God. So just as we, when we look forward to heaven, are looking forward to putting on our perfect heavenly bodies, so is all of creation looking forward to the same. It wants its new body. It wants to be remade. And Jesus says that he won't just limit himself to renewing people. He is going to make all parts of God's creation new. Thus, this world will end. We get a couple pictures of that in the Bible. 2 Peter 3.10 says that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Get this picture of like a slate being wiped com completely clean. Scouring the earth all the way down to the bedrock. Hebrews 11.12 has a different uh, metaphor here. It says, like a robe, you will roll up the world. Like a garment, it will be changed. Now, what we have to understand, and this is really important here, is that Jesus will not be making a brand new creation. He's not going to be completely ending everything, throwing it in the waste bin, and rolling up his sleeves and says, okay, let's start over. But just like how he takes our bodies, our imperfect bodies now, and resurrects them as new, as fresh and new, and perfect, he will do the same with the universe. He will be remaking it. It's new in terms of quality and freshness, while still retaining its old identity. New in quality and freshness. And we will all have front row seats for that day when the Lord is making all things new. I can just picture all of us, all the elect in the stands, watching Jesus as he conducts this great recreation. And we will be cheering him on as he scours the universe to remove every trace of sin, every hint of imperfection, destroying death itself. The curse that God pronounced on creation in Genesis 3 will one day be lifted entirely. We will be celebrating a, a creation of peace. The old universe, the old world is crammed with nothing but conflict and hatred. We are so full of it, and we are so done with it. We want it to be over and done with. But then we go to Isaiah 1.6, and it gives us those famous verses where it says what? The wolf and the lamb will lay down together. The leopard and the goat will hang out together, and nobody's going to be thinking about taking a bite out of each other. Right? This picture of peace, former enemies, former adversaries, a predator and a prey now living together, this idea of peace that persists. We'll be celebrating a creation that's fruitful, that's bursting with life. Remember that the curse of creation says you're going to have to work the ground. It's no longer going to just give you food. You're going to have to really work for it. And there's going to be weeds and thistles and all these things that we hate. But Isaiah 35.1 says that in this new creation, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. The most barren places in the world will suddenly come alive and be fruitful. And creation itself will celebrate its makeover. Listen to Psalm 96. Again, this personification, this anthropomorphizing of nature that we read in the Bible. It says, let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming. Man, creation will just be on its feet too. We are ready. Remake us, Lord. Make us better. The best part of this renewal is that no longer will heaven and earth exist as separate entities in separate realms. But rather, the vision that John was given in Revelation talks about a heaven and earth that comes together that becomes one. And because it becomes one, we exist in heaven and in earth at the same time, and God is with us always. He is dwelling with his people. He brings his home to our home, and it becomes together us. And if that's not a great cause for celebration, how about a grand wedding feast? 
that Jesus himself is planning for us. Every month we come to the Lord's table, and one thing I, I'm hoping that we're communicating and teaching <coughs> is that the Lord's uh, table has many different dimensions. Many think that it's there to teach us and help us understand about our relationship with God and about what the Bible is saying. And one of those dimensions is that the communion's purpose is to get us excited about this greater celebration to come. Have you ever found it weird when we celebrate the Lord's table that you get teeny tiny little piece of bread and a teeny tiny little thimble of juice? When I was a kid, I thought the church was being cheap. I'm like, what? you guys can't afford more than one piece of bread and a tiny little thing. I mean, like, why don't I have a big Hawaiian roll in one hand and a, a, a can of grape juice in the other? Something like that. It's not the church being cheap. I think it's practically that the church doesn't want somebody to spill a giant amount of grape juice if they happen to spill it. But the idea here is this, this Lord's table that we partake in is small. It is a taste, but it is not fullness. It doesn't satisfy us. It leaves us wanting something more. It leaves us wanting something greater. And so the next time you take that little bit of bread and that little bit of juice, is meant to make you think that one day you will come into a feast where you will eat and drink your fill. You will be so satisfied, so gratified. It will be something greater than these monthly celebrations that we have. Revelation 19 tells us that one day the lamb will be brought together with his church, this wedding feast, into a, a time of union and intimacy and fellowship. Well, the problem, of course, is that we do not make a very good bride. And I'm not just talking about the guys going, I don't want to wear a dress here. Uh, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the fact that we are coated with sin. We are abhorrent in the sight of God. We do not deserve as a bride. If we were, if we were a bride, our wedding dress would be in tatters, and it would be caked with grime, and we would look, look on the worst day of our lives. So we would be unappealing and ugly to our Jesus. And coming to him in that state wouldn't be a cause for celebration. It would be a cause for terror. How can we present ourselves as a bride to him? Something has to be done to make us worthy of a groom who is perfect. Well, in the Old Testament, Israel had a practice. That, say a guy wanted to get married to a woman. So he would go to his this woman's family, and he would pay what's called a bride price. Whatever that price was, he had to go to the father and say, here's a chunk of money, I'd like to marry your daughter. Now this wasn't a scam. What the purpose was of this was for the father of the bride to say, you have enough money that you can take care of my daughter. That you have enough money that you could take care of your children if you decide to have them. I need to make sure you are financially well off. So the, the groom would go, the prospective groom, and pay the sign of commitment. I am committing to taking care of this woman. Here is the money that I have, some money that I have, and I will continue to provide and take care of her. The bride price is something that Jesus paid for us. When he's on the cross, he paid the bride price. And it was so costly and so expensive for us, but he paid it even so. But what's interesting is that once he paid that price, he also assumed the responsibility to care for us and the responsibility to nurture us. We were now his bride, but we were imperfect and we were in our sin, so he needed to do something to make us presentable to himself. And so he took people such as we, who are deeply damaged. He said, I'm going to start working on you. I am going to make you pure and spotless through this process of justification, sanctification, and glorification. So, so that when you go from the beginning, you are not worthy of me. But once I put you through this process, you will come out and you'll be made amazing. Ephesians 5 tells us exactly how we're going to come out of that process. That Jesus will present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Don't just take away the, for the fact that God's saying you're not going to have wrinkles one day. 
as amazing as that is, but that you will be radiant and blameless. You will come into a wedding feast. You will open up the doors, and you will see your groom, Jesus Christ, sitting at the front of the table, and he will look at you with such love and such admiration because you yourself, if you could see yourself in a mirror, will be radiant and pure and blameless because he made you that way. That's what he does for you. And so blessed are those, the angel said, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I want to end today by reading the prophet Isaiah's description of the wedding celebration that will follow from his 25th chapter. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the people, the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what a cause to celebrate. A place where there is no pain, no sin, no tears, no death. But Lord, also a place where there's no reproach. For you have made us holy and blameless in your sight. Lord, help us to live in an excited state today where we know what's going to come. We know that one day we will walk into that wedding feast. We will look around at the faces of those we love and we will look upon you. And we will know that day this is where I belong. This is where I was meant to be. And Lord, we will know one more thing that we would not be there if it was not for you, for your grace and your mercy and the bride price that you paid on that cross. In your name. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, please click the link in the upper right-hand corner to view our message, the most important video you will ever watch. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., either in person at 2595 Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore, New York, or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash knoxepc. Find past sermons on our website knoxepc.com forward slash sermons. Stay up to date with Knox Church. To receive our monthly newsletter, email office at knoxepc.com. If you need prayer, send an email to pastor at knoxepc.com. You can request text alerts by texting 734-968-1847. Knox Sunday School happens every Sunday at 9 a.m. for kids grades kindergarten through 8th, and for adults of all ages. Email office at knoxepc.com for more information. Knox Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Our motto is truthful teaching, and graceful living. We are committed to growing in the knowledge of Jesus, serving Him by serving others, and loving the body of Christ. To donate to Knox Church via PayPal, visit knoxepc.com and click on giving at the top of the page, or scan the QR code above with your smartphone or tablet. Special thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the members of Knox Church. Without them, this outreach wouldn't be possible.